And the referee again checking his watch. And, and there, there it goes! goes. The final whistle! Carlos Morrison will wait inside the box for this from Martin Nash. And a header on it there. And that might have been it. That is a goal for Canada. The header was adjacent to Boss. On left chance for Canada. Sophie Schmidt takes a reflection down the sun. There's down the goal. Welcome to the Canada Soccer Nation podcast. My name is Jason DeVos. I'm the Director of Development with Canada Soccer, and I'm joined by Brad Fougere, Digital and Corporate Communications Manager with Canada Soccer. Mr. Fougere, how are you today? I'm doing great on this March 239th. Is that what today is? (laughs) I think so. It feels like it for sure. It's been a a very long eight months months, I think it is from then to now or something around that range. It feels like eight years sometimes, but, uh, it's, uh, it's been a challenging time, but, uh, I'm, uh, I've got, I've got mixed emotions about today's, uh, episode. I'm, I'm bitterly disappointed that we've been let down by Mr. Richard Scott, who was, was lined up and ready to go as our, our short form guest and was going to enlighten us with the, the, the beautiful mind of all of the wonderful statistics of Canadian soccer and, and, uh, and how he catalogs all of that. But he stood us up, Brad. He absolutely he stood us up. He did. And we take this somewhat lightheartedly. However, <laughs> we also know that he actually is a wealth of this information. And that if we 100%. can get him in fine form, yeah. and we could get him to present some of this stuff, that it will be... It will be enlightening. Mind boggling. <laughs> like, it will be enlightening. The information he, he carries around with him is, is <laughs> incredible. Um, so we'll, we'll have to figure it out. We'll tease him a bit more. Yeah. And- if I need a fact, I go to Richard Scott. If I need, I need some result from the 80s or who was a goal scorer or the third assist on a goal, uh, I go to Richard Scott because he has, he has that information catalog somewhere, either in his mind or in a database somewhere. Uh, and he always delivers, but uh, unfortunately, he did not deliver um, when it was time to record the podcast. So um, I'm disappointed by that. But on the flip side, one person's misfortune is another's opportunity, and we have two amazing guests coming up on the podcast today. So please stay tuned for that. But before we get to them, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the world of uh, of soccer right now with Canadians and, and Canadian teams. Brad, uh, there's a certain award that uh, gets handed out uh, every year called the Golden Boy. Tell us a little bit about that and the two yeah. Canadians that are on that list. It's exciting. So we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we have the long form list for the Golden Boy, which is it's shortened to twenty now isn't it it is now shortened to 20 and lo and behold both of the gentlemen that we've been following and talking and gushing and excitedly uh, effusing about over the entire canada soccer nation podcast remain on that list and it would be remiss to not mention uh, that canadians can go and vote for that so if you follow our twitter account at canada soccer en or at Canada Soccer FR, you can find the link to go and vote for either Jonathan David or Alfonso Davies. And I have it on good authority that you can vote more than once if you're in private browsing or if you use a different browser. So I would definitely encourage all Canadians, uh, certainly fans of the men's national team, fans of Alfonso, fans of Jonathan David to go and vote for that award. Uh, Still don't have the timeline on when that will come out. They're somewhat secretive on exactly what the release date will be for the Golden Boy announcement. But uh, Fingers crossed that one of Jonathan or Alfonso Davies can make their mm-hmm. way to the top. Mm-hmm. Have we set up a software program to repeatedly vote from that every every minute for them, both of them? Might be I an option for us. Recognize this is Canada, but I will <laughs> plead the fifth. <laughs> okay, uh, we good. should also say happy Thanksgiving to everyone, Jason. We yes. Just, yeah, we missed that. It was last that. weekend. So yeah. how was Thanksgiving for you? Thanksgiving was great. Thanksgiving was great. Um, I had uh, some family, just our close bubble, come and have Thanksgiving dinner with us. Had a quick conversation with our kids who are six and eight about how thankful we should be that we got to spend all this extra time with them over the last eight months. It's definitely been a challenge for them not having the social circles that they're used to having. Yeah. Um, But, you know, as someone with... uh, with bosses and mentors around me who have children who have now left the home. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely taking this time to heart and recognizing that not too many people get to spend the amount of quality time with their six, seven, 
eight year old that that I do right now. So so yeah, really really thankful for that. How about you? Yeah, it was great. Um, went uh, north into cottage country with my my wife, my two kids, my two dogs, and and just tried to relax and and unwind. And and it was absolutely stunning up there. If you've never been to cottage country in in Ontario, there's multiple cottage countries now. It's not just. Uh, north of Barry, up and towards Muskoka, you've got the Kawarthas, Halliburton up that way, the Ottawa Valley, there's, there's loads of places, but the stunning fall scenery was just breathtaking. Uh, the change of colors in the trees was, was amazing. And so went, uh, went out for a few long drives with my children and got to see the, the sights and the, the beautiful scenery of, of our country and, and be thankful for being Canadian and living in this great country and, and having the opportunity to continue to grow and develop the game and, and work with people from coast to coast. It's been, uh, it's been a tough couple of months for sure for everyone involved in soccer in our country, but it's also been a time to really appreciate the, the how special it is and how fortunate we are to be able to do this. So it was a very good weekend and I hope everyone listening had a wonderful weekend with family as well and uh, managed to stay safe. Uh, on the professional soccer front, uh, what have you been watching of late that's caught your eye? I'm going to keep it to one thing in this intro. We can talk about it a little bit later, but I, I, I think it's important to note that Christine Sinclair led the Thorns to the NWSL Fall Series title by being Christine Sinclair, by being yeah, incredible. Scoring, by scoring goals, goals and being goals better and than everyone. Bunches and <laughs> being insane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so congratulations to the Thorns. Congratulations to Christine, uh, who recently had her 300th career goal across international and club competition. Uh, thanks to Richard Scott for tracking all of those. Uh, although I did see a few comments on Twitter saying, hey, did you think about the goals that she scored at this level or in this? So uh, we'll have to we'll have to keep an eye on that. Once she retires, I think we'll do some forensic accounting to try and figure yeah. out how many goals that she actually scored. And we'll probably find it's closer to one million. Uh, over the weekend, the Newfoundland and Labrador Soccer Association managed to get their uh, provincial championships in. So obviously the Atlantic bubble um, has led to lesser restrictions, I guess we'll say, um, on organized sport. And so uh, congratulations to Holy Cross, who won both the men's and women's uh, senior titles in Newfoundland. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, if we ever track down Richard Scott, we'll be able to uh, and ask him those questions about Christine Sinclair's goal total. And I'm sure he will know how many national provincial titles that uh, every team in Canada has won at every level. And uh, look forward to that conversation with him for sure. But uh, after the break, we are going to be joined by our first guest, uh, Miss Carol Ann Chenard, who has recently retired from her stunning career as a referee. And we're going to chat with her a little bit about her career and uh, how she got into refereeing, how, how she started a previous career in sport that many people, myself included, didn't know about, um, but also what's next for her. So stay tuned for that after the break. It's coming up in a minute. Carol Ann Chouinard has long been at the pinnacle of international refereeing, breaking barriers over an impressive career that placed her as an inspiration for aspiring referees from coast to coast to coast. Canada Soccer is proud of and celebrate Carol Ann's professional achievements and know that she will continue to be a leader for young referees in Canada and abroad. Those are not my words. Those are the words of uh, Stephen Reed, Canada Soccer's president, uh, about the retirement of Carol Ann Chouinard. I'm very pleased to have her joining us on the podcast right now. First and foremost, Carol Ann, I have to say on behalf of all Canadians, congratulations on an absolutely stellar career as a referee. Well done. And the entire country celebrates you. Thank you for joining with uh, us on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for uh, those kind words. So I want to talk a little bit about your career as a referee and and your your memories of that and what you're going to take away from that experience. But I, I want to start with this. I didn't know this until very recently, but you were a, a very celebrated international athlete prior to getting into refereeing. Tell us a little bit about your speed skating career first. Sure. So I started speed skating a very, very long time ago, far longer, um, uh, longer ago than I started refereeing. But uh, yeah, I was a national team uh, speed skater for about five years in the late 90s and early uh, 2000s, if that doesn't date me. Um, and yeah, I was a member of the national team. I competed at uh, the World Cups and uh, some international competitions. And in 2002, I guess I retired from, from my career as I 
I guess, officially an athlete, but like I've always said, I, I still consider myself an athlete, but um, I had a lot of really great opportunities early on as an athlete uh, in my career. So how did you, how did you get into refereeing? What was the, the spark for you? Why did you make the decision to move in that direction? Sure. So the way I started refereeing really was I was a soccer player, a young soccer player, and uh, our my coach made the entire team take a kind of refereeing course so that we better understood the laws of the game, and maybe he <laughs> thought it would it would help us uh, stop yelling at the referees. And then was your he, was your coach called Joe Guest by any chance? Because <laughs> he wasn't. He wasn't. <laughs> but I'm sure you've heard this multiple times. Oh yes, I'm a player, and I know nothing about the laws of the game. <laughs> exactly. Maybe my coach was before his time. And so when, and once we passed that course, he basically, he also worked for, you know, a local association and we were given the opportunity if we wanted to, to start refereeing. And, you know, I started refereeing what I call swarm soccer, you know, under six, <laughs> under seven soccer and, yeah. and, you know, got opportunities to start refereeing house league. And I was using it at the time to, you know, make money to put it away to, to go to university. And, um, you know, people said that I was okay and that I was good, but really I was I always considered myself an athlete and I was, a, you know, a speed skater first and a soccer player first. And it happened to be one night, Friday night, uh, I went to referee what we used to call old timers. So over 35. So now I don't like that term because I'm over 35. Yeah, you but, and me both. Um, <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, it was always kind of a difficult league to referee because everybody used to say, um, I've been, ref you know, playing longer than you've been alive. And I was a professional <laughs> player back in Italy and England. And, yeah, of course. Um, yeah. And I, and I did, I did a game there and actually one of the teams wrote to the provincial association and said, you know, somebody really needs to come watch this girl referee. She's really good. And, um, that was kind of the beginning, I guess, of my journey, um, where people started to come watch me from the province and my local organization. I started to get more opportunities for bigger games as they came to the city in Ottawa. And um, I guess it was really there that the referee carrot, I guess you could say, started to get dangled in front of my face. I never thought I would be a FIFA referee, even when people said it to me, you know, if you asked me as a 16, 17, 18 year old, do you want to be a FIFA referee? I mean, who wants to be a referee? I would have nodded yes, because I think that's what people wanted to hear. But in my head, I was like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> um, and then I just, I had a lot of great experiences. And, and when I retired from, from skating, I was, I was a provincial referee at the time. And it really provided me, you know, the opportunity to continue in the sport that I loved in a different capacity. But you know, people really recognize something in me and that really, that kind of validation, you know, really helped me kind of move forward in a, in a, in a difficult career, I guess most people would call refereeing a difficult career. So yeah, that's how I got started. You progressed to the FIFA level in a relatively short period of time. Uh, your first professional appointment in 2005, I think it was in 2006 that you were, uh, you were added to the FIFA list and, and you've, you've refereed at virtually every level of the game, uh, certainly on the women's side and uh, also on the men's side of the game. Um, you refereed in, in the CPL in, in MLS. Uh, what's the highlight for you? What was, what's the one moment where, you know, you were, were getting ready to go out onto the pitch uh, to call a game and you thought, wow, th this is, this is the very top. You know, it's really hard to sum up 15 years on the internationalist in one in one moment, you know, I can I can remember the the very first international game and that feeling of walking out, which I'm sure you know you've you've had that feeling of you know representing your country and your confederation, um, you know, at the international stage. But you know, if there's really one um, one moment, it really you know, if you think about the Olympics in 2012 in London in Wembley in front of 73,000 people, you know, yeah. it wasn't a final, but it really was, you know, uh, it was the biggest crowd I've ever refereed in front of. It was the, the home team. Um, you know, it was with, you know, uh, an, another Canadian on the pitch with me. Um, so that was a really, really big moment. It was my first real senior kind of soccer final, um, at the international stage. So it was a really big moment for me. Yeah. We've spoken with Isaac Raymond uh, previously about uh, what the experience was like at the Island Games, the CPL, being in the bubble. And, and one of the things that came through loud and clear is that 
um, fraternity, the relationship, the collaborative approach that all match officials take when they're working together as a crew. You must have made some amazing friends over the years working with these people in really difficult environments in top games. What are some of the, the memories that you take back from that? Uh, I, it's, 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 you know, it's really hard to explain. Um, we're really like the extra team, right? We're at a tournament. We are the, you know, whether it's 16 teams, we're the 17th team or whether it's 24 teams, we're the 25th team. We really, um, work together every day. Um, and I've always said, nobody understands what it feels like to walk onto a pitch and either to make a great call or, you know, or the opposite, right? To, to really make a mistake that has an impact in the game. And the only people that can really understand what that feels like are other referees. Mm. And so we really do work as a team. And, um, I've been really lucky through the 15 years of my career, you know, to have a really core group of, of colleagues, um, you know, BB Anna Steinhaus being one of them, you know, who was at, we went to our very first tournament together and we literally did, there was only two tournaments um, that I've done or actually two tournaments that we've done that we haven't been together. So one was um, uh, the under 17 men's in uh, U20 men's in India in 2017. And that was because she was making her debut in the Bundesliga and the tournament in France um, that I wasn't able to attend. So um, you know, a real core group of people. And I think um, the, the, it's really made me realize this year, this past 18 months where I've been battling cancer. I mean, they reached out to me on a daily basis during the World Cup and they continue to support me, um, you know, in my in my recovery. And uh, I couldn't ask for better teammates. That's for sure. There, there's an expression in football that uh, players are are the only professional players are the only people on the planet that die twice once at the end of their life and once at the end of their professional playing career because it's such a change for them um, from what they've become used to for so many years now I know that that almost all referees if not all referees are far more well adjusted than players are um, but what's next for you w- where do you take your experience and your wealth of knowledge uh, as a referee at the highest level of the game how do you impact the next generation of Canadian uh, referees so I really love that analogy because while I do consider myself relatively well adjusted this has been really <laughs> a difficult transition for me and took a it's lot hard. longer than it really yeah. is you know and I mean it's not the way I wanted to go out but it really is it's a big change right it's it's a big part of your identity um so for me I think uh the next step really is giving back right to the sport I love there are so many people who have helped me get to where I am. So whether that's at the local level or at the international level. And so I'm hoping to use, you know, my experience. Um, I want to become an instructor and instruct, um, you know, the next FIFA referees, whether that's in Canada or internationally, um, you know, because experience is a really big part of refereeing, right? Just mm-hmm. like, like players, you know, the first game at any level um, is really difficult. The second game even, you know, always feels easier just because of the experience. And so if I can use any of um, the good times and the bad times and the small tips and tricks that I've learned over the years to make somebody else's experience better, um, then I want to do that. And, you know, we need to start retaining referees locally. And so I'm hoping that my experience will, will help, uh, do that. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, I commentated on uh, on many of the games that you called in in my previous role as a as a soccer analyst, and I cannot remember a single decision that you made that I questioned. Now, Joe Guest would say that's because I don't know anything about the laws of the game, and that you were always right, anyways. But uh, I think you just had an absolutely incredible career. You're a shining light for all Canadians, boys and girls, about what you can do if you work hard. You know, you surround yourself with the right people and, and you take your opportunity when it when it presents itself. Uh, again, Carol Ann, congratulations on an amazing career. I really look forward to seeing what's next for you and, and uh, the impact that you're going to have on the next generation of referees in Canada. Thanks so much, Jason. I really appreciate this opportunity. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, after the break, we'll speak to another female leader in the game. Uh, Sarah Orell is going to be joining us from Guelph Soccer to talk about all things COVID related and how they've managed their way through the pandemic and what's to come from them as a club moving forward. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. 
Pleased to be joined by our guest today. Sarah Orell is the general manager of Guelph Soccer Club in Guelph, Ontario. And she's been in that role for a little over a year, I believe, but we'll get, get into that in just a second with her. But she's managed her way through this pandemic crisis that everyone in soccer is dealing with. And I first met Sarah earlier this year in about uh, February 2020. And I, I hijacked a conversation she was having with a good friend of mine, Mr. Dermot Salvadori, and sat down and wanted to listen to what she had to say. And over an hour later, I felt so bad because I completely hijacked their conversation, which my staff will tell you I do all the time. But I was just so enlightened by what she had to say and and really impressed with her grasp of some of the issues that we're dealing with in, in Canadian soccer in how to empower more women to be leaders in the sport. And, and she most certainly is one of those. So I would very much like to welcome to the podcast today, Miss Sarah Orell. How, how are you today? Jason, I'm great. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. It's, uh, it's a little bit cool today. It's raining in Guelph. Um, I want to give a big shout out to the city of Guelph. Beautiful city, 130,000 people. Great city to live and work in. Uh, I love I love this community. So I'm glad to to join you and talk a little bit about my journey here at Guelph Soccer, but uh, also just soccer generally. Is, is that a hometown shout out? Were you born and raised in Guelph or, or, ah, or were great you born question. elsewhere? Yeah, no, I was born and raised in Richmond Hill, spent Richmond all Hill. of my okay. youth playing for Richmond Hill Soccer Club, loved the club, great memories. I have some of the fondest memories of that Mother's Day tournament we would play. My mom would line the car with garbage bags because of all the mud <laughs> we'd be covered in. Uh, so, so no, not born and raised in Guelph, but moved here to do my undergrad, fell in love with the city, um, and now I'm here raising my family. Yeah. What did you do your undergrad in? What was your area of study? I studied sociology. I wasn't particularly sure what I wanted to do. Um, and so I jumped right in with sociology. And before I even finished my undergrad, I started working for Guelph Soccer, yeah. which was sort of like an entry point into working in the sport. I had played all of my youth. I coached a little bit. I refereed a little bit. Remember, I've got some fond moments of my mom setting up shop, sort of a halfway line and letting everybody around know that she was the referee's mother in case they had anything to say. Brilliant. Um, they had to get through I, mom before they got to the referee. Eh? <laughs> correct. Um, so, but then after, while I was doing my undergrad, I, I got involved with the club. I started volunteering a little bit and then started working. And I spent about four and a half years right after my undergrad working for Guelph soccer. And that was a great experience. And then spent uh, quite a bit of time out of soccer, but 10 years in the charitable sector with the Canadian Cancer Society and then March of Dimes Canada. Mm -hmm. And then it just drew me back in. I couldn't stay away for too long and uh, had the opportunity to come up with the general manager position. And I am what I like to call a boomerang employee. I came back <laughs> and, and that was about two and a half years ago now. Yeah. Good. That's, um, it's interesting. You, you talked a little bit there about some of the other areas of your 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 professional career you worked at in in the nonprofit sector um obviously a lot of soccer clubs in Canada are also nonprofits but uh, more of a different type of a focus what do you what do you take from the experiences prior to coming back to the club that you had in the corporate world working in the nonprofit sect, uh, sector what did you take out of that to apply to the role you're in now which is managing a, a, a grassroots minor soccer club so I think there's two things that I think I brought with me when I came back to Guelph soccer, and it was the desire uh, to engage volunteers. Uh, so obviously many of our volunteers at nonprofit soccer clubs uh, are our coaches. And so in the charitable sector, we engage uh, a tre tremendous amount of volunteers. So it, it was really that volunteer engagement piece. How do we engage volunteers? How do we recruit them? How do we recognize them? How do we retain them? How do we keep them involved? Um, and then also the, the board governance piece. There's a lot of charitable organizations that do this really well. They really know their role, what staff operations does, what board governance does. And, and those sometimes can get pretty muddy in, in soccer organizations. So that was really helpful coming back to soccer, having a little bit of that experience. 
So what's the secret? I think everyone in, in Canada wants to know the answer to this. What's the secret? How do you engage volunteers? How do you, how do you incentivize them? How do you reward them? How do you keep them engaged? Because I think everyone's talking now, certainly through this period of time, about the decline in volunteerism and, and community spirit. So what do you do at your club to try and uh, engage with your volunteers and, and keep them um, you know, committed to being part of the club and the community? So it's definitely a challenge. I don't think there is a silver bullet here at all, but I do think that people really appreciate being involved in um, and supporting things that they help create. So that co-creation piece is, Mm -hmm. is paramount. So how do we engage people through the process? And I think our challenge there is we're trying to balance this co-creation and the length of time it takes to do a full engagement process with the parents that wanted it yesterday. Yeah. So that's the tricky balance that we're, we would love to engage more people in the process, but we have parents that are looking um, to have it finished yesterday. And really, we know that the right process is the longer process. And sometimes that just, you know, takes a bit of communication to make sure that we get that message out, that, that there's a reason why things are taking a little bit longer sometimes, because we want to get it right the first time. Yeah. The long term isn't a great uh, a quick win is it it's not a it's not an answer that m- many people will find palatable that yeah this is going to be difficult and it's going to take a long time how do you communicate that to parents and and what do you focus on in that messaging i think often parents just appreciate knowing that there's been thought put into it so taking the time to have those conversations with parents about why something may be taking longer or where we're at with the process i like to think that our entire team at Guelph Soccer is, is a pretty open book. We're, we're pretty pr- transparent group. If you've got a question for us, we often have more information. It may not be exactly what you want to hear, but there's, there's often uh, lots more information there to help parents better understand why things sometimes take a little bit longer than yesterday. Mm. I always say to people that um, the relationship with parents is is absolutely crucial for any successful grassroots organization uh, at any level. It is the relationship that you have, the transparency that you have. And and the analogy that I like to use, it's a little bit like your relationship with your child's teacher in school. You have to be partners in the education of your children rather than a consumer where you're expecting them to do all the work for you and and have all the answers. Is that an approach that you take at Guelph where you you try and partner and, and, and work with the parents in the development of their kids in soccer? Absolutely. And I think that there is so much work still to be done in this area. I think parent mm-hmm. engagement is something that we're beginning to scratch the surface on, but there's lots of work to be done. Uh, I'm sure you know Sky and Bruce well. She does great work in the United States. And I think that those are some of the areas that we're looking at to go, how do we further engage parents in this process? So it's not just a, you know, a, a, a drop off and go, but instead people feel really a part of the process, whether it's the child's development or just what's happening generally with the organization, being active members within the club. You've managed your way through a really difficult period of time. And I think everyone involved in the game right now is, is, is hurting and struggling. How how have you managed uh, as a club, as an organization through COVID-19? So I think when we spoke yesterday, I said that the last Six months have probably been the most difficult six months of my professional and personal career. I have two boys, they are eight and six. So I did the juggling act that many parents did these past six months with no school. Uh, And that was certainly personally challenging, trying to find all of the time in the day. But then professionally, you know, leading an organization through arguably the greatest crisis it's ever faced has most certainly not been easy. Uh, Financial challenges with the drastic decline of of the biggest revenue driver in our organization being membership fees Mm -hmm. has been a a huge challenge. Being able to, you know, cut those uh, variable costs quickly, make hard, quick, decisive decisions, but having transparency through the process. It's It's been a big challenge. And then getting ourselves back on the field changing uh, as we go all the time, because just as we think we have something figured out, as I'm sure you know, at the national level, (laughs) 
it changes. <laughs> you, you got it. It changes. And then we just have to be ready to adapt yet again. So I think uh, the financial challenges have been difficult. And I think organizations are finding creative ways to get through. For us, it's been, you know, whether it's the the, the federal support that's been offered through the wage subsidy or uh, grants through community organizations. So there's been a lot of creativity there by a lot of organizations. But now it's the long haul that is the constant adapt as things change through the unknown that is the future. So it's it's definitely been a challenge. What I will say is, is I, I love to look for what are those things that are happening that might never have occurred had it not been for this crisis. And I think that COVID has, you know, turned our game upside down a little bit. And maybe in a, in a system that wasn't working perfectly, we're looking for opportunities to innovate now where we might not have done that previously. So I'm, I'm excited about the potential, about the fact that often there's a before the crisis and after the crisis moment. And we can never say that's how we always did things because that was before COVID. Everything has changed now. So now it's really an opportunity for, for us as Guelph Soccer, but also organizations to really look at things differently, to say, what is actually best for that kid, for those group of coaches, for these staff? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting perspective on it. And I love what you said there about there, this maybe being an opportunity. Um We'll 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 get producer Brad to fact check this, but I I I'm, I've been told that the Chinese word for crisis is actually the same word for opportunity, and and that is is really what I think a lot of organizations have had to do through this period is look at it from a the first perspective of crisis management. We have to maintain safety. We have to make sure that our kids are safe, and we have to do everything in our power to safeguard their well being. We also have to safeguard the organization and and do what's right for the organization moving forward so that it can continue to operate in in the community. But then you also look at it as a, a moment of self-reflection to say, what have we done really well and, and what can we do better? And, and maybe you start thinking about, well, where are the opportunities for growth here? What could we do differently? What could we, we change? And I think that's a really important aspect to understand. Um, how do you do that at a club level? You know, when you when you've had to cancel your recreational program through the summer and and shut down, how do you then start back up again? What are the what are the key aspects of your programming that you look at first? So I think for us uh, at the club, we looked at what does it take. So for our purpose is to get kids on the field. What does it take? It takes a patch of grass. It takes a ball. How can we do this as low cost, no frills as possible to make sure that the kids aren't waiting because we're waiting for the equipment, the jersey, the fields to be lined. Yeah. Um, and so at Guelph Soccer, what we did was we went completely no frills, back to basics, just play. And we called it, this was our relaunch of our recreational programming, we called it our neighborhood soccer program. And it allowed us to basically go into different parts of the city and set up shop. So on Monday nights, we were in the East End and we brought all the equipment. We set it all up. We had staff there doing the contact tracing and kids did a bit of game activity game. They they played for a bit. They did a little bit of an activity and then they played again. We really focused on, on play and encouraging kids to play. And then at the end of the night, we packed up and the next night we went to another neighborhood. And it because of the low cost. We asked kids to bring a dark and a light shirt and we had the equipment that was you know, already part of our inventory. It allowed access to soccer when maybe during these hard financial times, that would be a difficult thing for parents to consider. Mm -hmm. Do your boys play? They do. Uh, I got my eight-year-old and my six-year-old are playing. My six-year-old is the one that's particularly keen. So I'll be curious to see what he does with it. Uh, but yes, they do. They they play for fun. And uh, I think our favorite part about it all is just the fact that they know if they say, mom, do you want to go outside and play soccer? The answer to that question is always yes. Whereas if they were to ask me if I want to go shoot some hoops on the front driveway, <laughs> it's not quite the same answer. Are, are, are you the mom that lets them win or do you teach them the hard lessons of life and, and you're not beating mom no matter what? I'm going to ask you to predict the answer to that question. <laughs> 
I'm going to say that you teach them the hard lessons because <laughs> you I, I, got it. Of course I do. <laughs> Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, I, I was, I'm the same with my kids. <laughs> and I'm, they're a little, they're, a, well, they're a lot older than yours now, but yeah, I, I always, uh, I always used to teach them the hard lessons. And my, my daughter was a competitive swimmer. And I can only tell you uh, how humbling and humiliating it is to be beaten in a 50 meter freestyle by your 12 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. And I was swimming as fast as I could. And I wasn't even close to her. She was gliding through the water like a dolphin. Um, and, and she's never let me forget it. So lord it over your boys as long as you can. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure that time will come. I'm going to enjoy these moments of teaching them these hard lessons that, <laughs> hey, they got to work for it if they want to beat mom, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh -huh, that's brilliant. Um, you were part of a very small group of women that we brought together earlier this year, very successful women from across the country in either administrative roles, technical leadership roles, coaching roles. And we had two days of, of, uh, of a workshop online. We were originally going to, going to have that meeting in person, but COVID showed up and we had to postpone, but we shifted it to an online uh, experience. I think Brad and I may have talked about this previously on the podcast, but it was such an enlightening couple of days for me because just listening to the stories of all the women involved on how they got to be where they are in the game was utterly fascinating for me. The obstacles, the challenges, the the artificial impediments that were in their way and, you know, kind of sitting there taking notes and thinking this can't be how we move forward. We have to figure this out. And you mentioned something that I, I really resonated with me. You, you talked about the concept of the broken rung on the corporate ladder. Explain a little bit about that if you can and, and give our listeners a bit of insight into what that means. For sure. And I think that when we, we often think about barriers in it for women in leadership in the workforce, we often think about that glass ceiling that we can't tend to break through. But there's been a lot of research done that talks specifically about the broken rung. And that is that next step from that entry level coordinator role to the management position. And that rung on the ladder up is broken. So often what happens uh, for women is because it's broken, it's such a bigger jump for us to go up that ladder to reach the next step. And, and that means that we spend longer periods of time in our professional life in lower level coordinator level roles instead of gaining that leadership management experience. So that's definitely a challenge. It, it's a personal experience for me. That was my experience with golf soccer my first time around. I was in a coordinator level position for many years and there was just no, there was no opportunity. And, and sometimes that was no fault of anyone's, but just that there was a rung missing for opportunities. And I think it's really important as organizations and leaders, we begin to look at those people that are in those coordinator level positions and think about how we provide them those leadership positions. I, I had got some great advice from one of my mentors, and this was right at the back end of my playing career. And, and we were talking about my transition to another career. <laughs> Basically, as you retire as a player, you, you have to move into a, a whole other career, although it may be football related. Um, and he said to me something that's resonated and stuck with me all along. He says, whatever job you go into, whatever line of work you're in, one of the first things you need to do is identify who your successor is going to be and then work with that person so that when the time comes for you to move on to another role or, or even within the organization to move to a higher level of the organization, you have someone who is has been mentored and sponsored to come in and carry on the work that you've done. You don't want your work to die on the vine. And this concept came up in our discussions with the, the 10 women in the working group, this idea of sponsorship and mentorship and how important that is for female leaders within our sport to achieve levels of leadership. What does that mean to you? And, and how important do you feel that is to seeing more female general managers, technical directors, executive directors across the country? So I definitely value the concept of sponsorship, mentorship, somebody that is in a position, whether it's power or trust, that can provide you some guidance and some feedback as you sort of navigate often what feels like the unknown. Uh, one of the areas that I'm particularly interested in is this concept of networks. 
And sometimes that's linked to mentorship and sponsorship, but often that's linked to finding people that are that are like you and provide you a place where you feel like you belong. And I think for women in leadership positions in soccer, that can often be difficult. Mm. I'm part of many committees and I and I show up and I'm often the only woman on the screen screen right now, obviously. And, (laughs) and, and that, that can be difficult. Uh, And, and I I think after a while, you just begin to think that that's just how it is. But there is this sense of comfort, the sense of belonging that happens when you find people that can talk to you, honestly, about some of the challenges you're facing, but also can help lift you up when you're having those moments that are really hard. And I think it's pretty safe to say the last six months for us leaders in soccer, leaders everywhere, it's been really hard. So it's been really important that we have those networks of support to make sure that we we, we do get lifted up when we need to, um, because it, it's not easy. Yeah, you need someone that's going to put some wind in your sails. And, and uh, I don't care what level of the game you've played at. Um, uh, whether you're male or female, that's what great coaching is. It, it is being able to know when a quiet word of encouragement in the ear is going mm-hmm. to do a lot more benefit than, you know, tearing someone down for the mistakes that they've maybe made. Uh, there's a time and a place for for all different types of messaging, but I, I often feel that now through this period of time, people need to have some wind put back in their sails to give them hope for what the future is going to look like. And, and sharing that across organizations and, and across the country is an imperative component of that. In terms of a network, what does the future look like in that respect? You know, having gone through uh, online Zoom meetings, I mean, everyone's got Zoom fatigue. I think it's actually a medical <laughs> term now, um, but you've gone through online meetings, whichever platform you use. Has it helped make the country smaller? Is it is it something that is going to help us when it comes to networking, you think? I, I absolutely think so. And when I think about the the amount of opportunity, if I if I can look at the positives of this pandemic, technology is one of those. Technology is going to change the way that we do things. And I think it already has. I think you can probably speak lots to coach education and how you've drastically changed things at Canada Soccer and how you roll that all out. But I also think that it's changing how we're connecting with with one another. I think we probably would have been hesitant to to reach out to a colleague and say, can you, you know, can we jump on a Zoom meeting because we're across the province from each other? But but now a video conferencing call is second nature. So I I absolutely think that it's made our country smaller. I, I feel fortunate to have made connections. Sarah Maglio in BC, that's a great connection. And I think that that would have never happened had it not been for COVID and the ability for technology to, to really become at the forefront of our mind for how we're connecting with one another. I, mm-hmm. There's certainly, uh, you know, that, that face-to-face in-person connection, you, you, you can't take away the value that there is there. But I think in the absence of that, technology has really brought us closer together. Yeah, I, I I certainly feel that way across my team. I mean, we, we we work remotely anyway, so we're kind of used to it. But the extended team, I would say, of of technical directors across the country, the the members of the provincial territorial uh, member associations, we meet every two weeks on a video call. Everyone puts their cameras on, so we can all see each other's smiling faces, and and we we collaborate, commiserate, um, congratulate. Depends uh, depends on what's happening in in everyone's part of the country. But I think that really helps, and some of the the feedback that I got from from some of the guys on the call was that can we keep doing this? Is this something that that we can continue? Because it really does help connect the the whole country. Um, I, I want to go back to February when we first met and uh, at the Ontario Soccer Summit, and uh, you were sitting there after the summit. I think the summit was over; it was finished, everything was done, and you were just sitting there talking to Dermot Salvadori, who's the uh, the president of Richmond Hill. I'm not sure if he's still the president, but uh, the president of Richmond Hill. I'm Soccer not actually Club. sure they can get rid of him, but yes, he's still <laughs> yeah. the president, as far yeah. as I know. <laughs> <laughs> He'll love to hear that, I'm sure. Um, but I, I I sat down and r- rudely interrupted your your conversation with him and just kind of butted in. But I was just really intrigued by some of the comments that you'd made throughout the summit. I'd, I'd been in a couple of different panel sessions where you'd spoken and I was really interested in what you had to say. And one of the things that you mentioned to me as being an obstacle for women in soccer is that sometimes they need to be personally asked, not, not, um, 
you know, not, um, falsely put forward to, to do a role or to apply for a role that maybe they're not qualified for, but, but sometimes they need to be personally asked to step forward when they are fully qualified and they are deserving of an opportunity and maybe don't have that confidence in themselves to be able to do that for a, a wide variety of reasons. Can you talk a little bit about that concept? What does that mean to you? Yeah, and so I think that that came up when we were doing some of our work with our She's Got Game project, which was all about try to engage more women to coach within our within our club, truly. Um, and we had developed this, this neat mentorship program that brought women in, in a safe environment. They would coach uh, a girls program and uh, the parents would would know well up front that this is a a coaching mentorship program, not a, you know, high level skill development program. These, these women are learning. So a really safe environment where they can practice their craft. And we had designed it and had talked at length about it all. And then when you put the call out, nobody steps forward and you try to figure out what's, what's happening here. Where's the disconnect. And I think when I think about women needing to be personally asked, I don't, I don't know if it's about the, the lack of qualifications, although there's certainly research there that says, you know, men have to be 60 percent qualified for for a job to apply for it, whereas women feel the need to be 100 percent qualified to apply for the job. But I do think it's about the fact that women don't feel like they have any bandwidth. They're, they're at capacity. The plate mm-hmm. is full. And in order to add something else to the plate, we either need to make the decision to remove something else or we need to move some things around to make room for that additional thing that's going to be added to the plate. And the only reason we would consider adding something to the plate is if someone thought that it would really, you know, we would we would add value somewhere. And, and so I think that's a really important piece. And I don't know if that's necessarily unique to women. I think everybody likes to be personally asked to say, hey, Jason, you're really good at this. I think that you should consider this moving forward. Uh, But I think women in particular, because we're so thoughtful of what capacity we have as mothers, as wives, as, you know, leaders in our organizations and and just that that limited capacity that we have. So Mm -hmm. I think that the personal ask certainly goes a long way. It may have something to do with with our need to feel fully qualified for something. But I think it also has there's a part there that's related to how am I going to make everything work? And I really need to know that someone feels that I'm going to bring value. Otherwise it's, it's just, I just can't add one more thing. Yeah. How has the work environment or how should it change to accommodate that? Cause it's a great point. And, and you talk about females in the game and they're often wearing every hat under the sun. Um, and that's on top of all of uh, the, the roles that they may play uh, professionally or personally as a, as a family member, how do we change the, the work environment? So one of the things I'll give an example, I, I think through this period, we've become much better at working from home. We've figured it out. We figured out how to do that. Um, you've had to live the, the joy and pain of having your boys at home with you for six to eight months. Um, do you think that there are elements of how we do grassroots soccer in Canada that can change to make it more appealing for more women to maybe not have to remove something from their life to be able to have more of a role in the game? For sure. And I don't know if there's there's certainly a, a number of components that will help contribute to that. I think certainly the ability to work remotely, to not physically have to be present every single moment for, you know, whether it's every single game, every single program, every single session, things can take place without that female leader there at times. I I do think that there is this balance too of, you know, if, if you, if there is a committee meeting, you could do that from home electronically, that may help with balance. But I often think about women in the workforce and, and this is, uh, more of a societal challenge we have. And it this really has to do with the balance at home and the give and take that's happening within the household, right? We're mm-hmm. not going to solve that in soccer, but hopefully we can we can inch our way forward a little bit. But I do think in soccer, there is generally speaking this expectation that we work a hundred hour work weeks and we are everywhere. And I don't know if I don't want to speak for others, but I think that that's you come in and you feel this sense that I should be everywhere. And I think that 
we, everybody, men and women, need to give themselves permission to decide where they need to be, where maybe they don't need to be, where they have bandwidth, where they don't have bandwidth, because the, the organization will never tell you to work less or, or do less. But I think in order for us to encourage more women to be involved, we need to at least set the tone to indicate the fact that it doesn't take working 100 hours a week in order to be successful in these jobs. That's great advice. I think uh, I think a lot of people could benefit from that. Certainly, I I know that uh, I suffer from that affliction of of being the recovering perfectionist is probably the best term for it. That you know, there's just one more thing that you can get done today, and you know, you look up and it's ten o'clock at night. You're like, I've been working mm-hmm. since eight a.m. What, what what am I doing? Um, it, it's really about self care more than anything else because ultimately, you're not going to be much use to the organization if you're exhausted and burnt out. Um, what practical steps can you implement or, or have you maybe implemented in, in your own career to help manage that? You know, do you have set defined times where if the clock strikes five thirty, six o'clock, you're done? Do you switch off your phone when you get home or, or do you have it with you all the time? What do you do to try and manage that? So I wish I was better at this, obviously, as I try <laughs> and provide a little bit of advice, but what I will yeah. say, and I tell this to everybody, my email goes to my phone but my notifications are not on. So I have to purposely choose that in that moment, I'm going to open up my email and work is going to be upon me. Mm -hmm. So uh, previously the notifications would be on and I, you know, I would hear the ding and we're all (laughs) built this way that when you hear the ding, we're like Pavlov's dog. It it is, it is a a drug. You're you're trained to answer it. (laughs) Exactly. But then you go look at it and it's something that, it's maybe a bit of an issue, but it's not nothing you're going to solve tonight. You're going to probably solve it tomorrow. But now you're going to sit down for dinner and you're thinking about it and you're yeah. not present with your family. Yeah. And it's nothing that you could have solved in that moment anyways, or maybe you could have, but it's going to wait till tomorrow. So that I just eliminated that entirely. The notifications don't go off. If I feel like I'm somewhere or I have a moment that I'm going to check emails in the evening, then I do. Uh, but that's that's been a big piece for me. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that I'm a... We need to be in a lot of places for sure. There's certain times of the day we need to be there. We need to be very flexible with our hours. That's a given. But I will say too that I I try my very best to model the way for my team as well. Because if they see me emailing at 9 p.m. at night, mm-hmm. they begin to think that the expectation is that they're emailing at 9 p.m. at night. That's a so great point. Modeling the way for my team allows them to know that that is not the expectation. I don't need them to email me at 9 p.m. at night. I don't want them to be burnt out, to be totally exhausted. So, so those I would say are the two tips that I would that I use and implement regularly. There's probably lots that I don't even think about, uh, but but I think it's really important that we don't look at the work week and think we need to work 100 hours to be successful here because that is not attracting women to these roles. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Work smarter, not harder. It's a great piece of advice. It start with a blank sheet of paper. And, and I, I've asked this question to countless people across the country, design a soccer system that has gender equity. Where do you start? Tough one. I put you right in the spot here, Sarah. <laughs> of course. And I didn't expect anything less from you today, Jason. What I would say is that uh, gender equity is all about, it's about belonging, about people feeling safe. And it's about having a sense of community in our sport that any this this is available and accessible to anyone so i think and we can break that down to the programs that we offer when we think about you know how inclusive are our programs how accessible are our programs it's the same thing with our sports system how inclusive is our sports system how accessible is it so if i am somebody that may look or or am different is this sport system accessible to me? So I think that we would want to paint the picture of what we want it to look like. And then we build the system to match that picture. Mm. Start with the desired outcome and work back from there. That's a, that's a great, uh, great way to look at it. And I, and I think you're right. It, it hit, you hit the nail on the head there. It isn't just about gender equity. It's about uh, able uh, ability and disabled ability um, athletes having the opportunity to play 
um, the game in, in whichever form they wish to consume it in and, and having that opportunity. So the accessibility and inclusion piece is a really important aspect. And, and that's something that I'm sure we'll talk about in, on future podcasts in more detail. Final message. How do you want to, how do you want to sign off? You, you, you'd said earlier when we were talking offline that you were a little bit nervous about this, but it's just like playing a football game. You're nervous beforehand, but once you kick the first ball, you just fly right through it and you're a superstar. So, uh, how do you want to sign off uh, with a goal in the 90th minute? What what's the what's the one message that you would deliver to the the wider soccer community in Canada? So as community sports, things are hard right now. And I don't want to discount the fact that it's not hard. This constant requirement to adapt to the constant change in environment around us is really difficult. And I think we can acknowledge that. And it's okay to admit that things are hard. I think that we have great opportunity. And I'm excited about the innovation that will come out of this. And I'm excited about the level of collaboration we're already starting to see by organizations coming together because this is something that's affecting all of us. So uh, things are really tough right now. I can acknowledge that, you know, we're on this roller coaster and the highs are high and the lows are definitely low. But I think that uh, there is light. There's going to be some great collaboration, some neat, innovative ideas. And I think our system is going to be changed forever after this. Well, listen, keep up the fantastic work, Sarah. You're doing a great job. And I really look forward to what the future holds for you and and working together and collaborating more. And um, most importantly, stay safe, keep your family safe, keep your, your community safe. And we'll talk again soon. Thanks, Jason. Wonderful. When uh, when we come back after the break, producer Brad will correct all the mistakes I made and uh, do some fact checking for us and uh, talk about what's coming up in weeks to weeks ahead. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Canada Soccer Nation podcast. Uh, joined now by. Producer Brad, Brad Fougere, to debrief the discussions with Carol Ann Chenard and Sarah Orell. Let's start with Carol Ann, Brad. Again, I have to reiterate what a phenomenal role model she is for all referees in, in Canada, boys and girls. And, and she's been to the highest level of sport and has achieved just about everything. And I think it has to be said as well um, that she would have had many more prestigious appointments if she wasn't Canadian because our our female team has been successful over the years in many of these major tournaments and gone deep into the tournament and as a result it's maybe impacted her opportunities to get access to some of those bigger games Brad was is that fair to say yeah that, that's absolutely true uh, that's something that we spoke about yesterday when we were going through the list of achievements to try and build out um, a, a we didn't even to, talk about the list of achievements, but let's, let's, her. I mean, I'm, I know you have a, a long list in front of you. What, what she's done in the game is absolutely remarkable. For sure. And, and, and you honed in on it in a very short time. So she had her first professional appointment in the A-League in 2005. The very next year she got her first international appointment. And then yeah. it just, it just went from there. CONCACAF Women's Olympic Qualifying Tournament in 2008. CONCACAF Under-20 Women's Championship in 2008, CONCACAF Women's Under-17 Championship in 2008, FIFA U-20 Women's Cup Chile 2008. So right away, she was thrown into all of the top tournaments, both in the region and then at the youth level in the world. Um, in 2010, she was in the middle for the final of the U-20 Women's World Cup. Yeah. Uh, she was, in 2012, she was in the uh, CONCACAF Women's Olympic Qualifying Tournament final, and then the London 2012 Olympics, where, as she mentioned on that call, uh, yeah. she got to referee England at Wembley in front of 73,000 people, uh, which is an incredible achievement. She had the Al Algarve Cup final in 2013, followed by the final of the U-20 Women's World Cup Canada 2014 in Montreal, so on home soil. She was also mm -hmm. a referee at the FIFA Women's World Cup in Canada in 2015. She was appointed to the final of the 2016 Women's Olympic football final. And then she was part of a cohort of elite female referees at the 2017 FIFA U-17 uh, World Cup in India. Um, and then we talked about it. She broke barriers. She was part of an all-female squad um, and a Canadian Premier League match in their yeah. inaugural year. She was an MLS yeah. referee countless times, um, along with a number of her colleagues that we, we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't, I guess, ignore. I mean, it's definitely time to celebrate Carol Ann, but there are a number of elite female referees in Canada Soccer's referee program. Mm -hmm. um, Chantal Boudreau, Mary Soleil Baudouin, and there's a number of people coming up behind her who will 
see what she did, um, stare in amazement for <laughs> some amount of time at the list, um, and then go on to to do bigger and better things. I, I think about the Sinky 185 campaign and the number of Canadians who engaged in that campaign saying, well, mm-hmm. oh, my little girl is looking up to this. And, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, yeah, great. Go, go score 186. I mean, now it's 187. Yeah. And by the end, it could be 250. But <laughs> who knows at the pace that she's at in NWSL when, yeah. when they finally get back on the pitch. But, but yeah, she's, uh, she's definitely a shining light for referees, full stop for referees who, uh, who want to aspire. A good friend of mine, his daughter uh, is a, is a referee, and she's thirteen, fourteen years old, and she got into it a year ago or so, and and absolutely loves it, and and is very good at it by all accounts, and and does a really good job, and it's because of people like Carol Ann that she sees that as an opportunity, and you know we talk about the challenges that we face in this country in in getting more females into leadership roles. But there is a lot of really good work being done in that space. And there are some real trailblazers that are are paving a way uh, for that to happen, whether it's in coaching, whether it's in refereeing like Carol Ann Schnard. Uh, we've talked previously with, with Sandra Gage uh, as, as, as an executive leader within the organization and about having those women uh, showing young girls that this is a possibility for you. For you. I think Karina LeBlanc says it best when, when she says, you can't be what you can't see. And, and we're fortunate in our country that we can see so many really strong female leaders that are, are paving the way for the next generation. Um, which leads me to my, uh, my second question for you. What did you take out of our conversation with Sarah Orell? Well, Sarah Orell is a dynamo. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not much of a summary. If you listened this far into the show, you're already thinking those things. Yeah. Um, but just so eloquent um, and, and such fully formed ideas about the types of things that need to happen in order to um, encourage people like her who clearly are dynamos, but have that inkling of self-doubt because of the system and just because of the realities of sort of corporate life. Um, yeah. I mean, she has a very interesting background. Coming from a, a nonprofit background is no joke. I, I mean, you, you, your resources are nil right you have no resources you're entirely dependent on volunteers um and, and anyone who works in soccer and who's listening to this recognizes this but yeah um you you are constantly required to be on you're constantly required to be um anything that your volunteer base needs you to be because you need them and without them you're cooked <laughs> so um i think guelph have a shining star um sure this won't be the last time we speak to her and i'm sure that it won't be the last time um people are hearing about her in in soccer um because mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> what a what a dynamo yeah if people are wondering how this podcast is put together and it it's not scripted it's certainly not uh, anything like television where we have a, an actually you know a rundown minute by minute of what the show is going to look like and um, some days I have a lot of time to prepare and other days I don't <laughs> today was one of those days uh, I only just asked uh, asked Sarah yesterday uh, if she would be a guest on the podcast I'd, I'd realized that I hadn't lined up a guest for this week so I was speaking with her um, uh, at length about some other topics of discussion and I asked if she'd be interested in coming on and and uh, so she said yes and and a little a little hesitantly I think um as many many people are when they first get asked to do something that they've never done before but uh, I didn't send her any of the questions I didn't script any of the questions which I sometimes do and often do but uh, just didn't have time today so the what I say to everybody when they come on the podcast is it's just you and me having a conversation and we're just going to take it wherever we take it and uh, I'll follow your lead and and we'll go down whichever path you want to want us to go down and so all of the answers answers that she gave were genuine and honest answers that just came to her off the top of her head, which I think is even more remarkable given how insightful they were. So potentially not all that surprising though. She gave some hints that that's, that's maybe one of her strong suits, right? I, yeah, I, some of sure. the, some of the topics that she talked about um, being really important opportunities where we are right? adaptability. Yeah. <laughs> right? She, she yeah. clearly has that one in spades. Yeah. For um, sure. and, it, and it was really interesting to hear her talk about um, not only the women's leadership group and the opportunity that she has uh, in engaging with those people, and and she referenced some directly, but just the collaboration and the opportunity that there is for collaboration right now, where the pace is a little bit slower, the fear that we'll get back to normal is growing. 
right? Like, like let's call a spade a spade. We're, we're not sure yeah. when. January yeah. 1st changes nothing. So 2021 no. comes along and where are we? We're, we're right where we are today, right? So we still, we still have the challenges that we have, but the challenges um, can be met and, and, and they're going to be met by, by innovating. They're going to be met by doing things like her community programming that she did, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Going community to community and, and just reminding people that here's the game. It's this ball and at least two people <laughs> go. Um, so yeah, it just, it, it was great. What it, it just a great show. I, mean, I love these shows where we, um, have such great back-to-back guests. And in this case, you know, really terrific female leader guests back to back. And we've had a few of these and they seem to be our best shows. Yeah. I really liked what she said about the community project that they worked on and, and the simplicity of it and, and the importance of having a community and serving the needs of that that community and, and i think we forget about that a lot of times we we often get caught up in the craziness of of youth soccer that it can be where uh, people parents coaches not often players because they gen genuinely just want to play the game it's it's often the adults but we get so caught up with which team my child is on and are they going to make it to the next level because they have to be on this team or that team. And the reality is, you know, if your, if your child's good enough, they'll get to the level that they should get to. There's very, very few, if any, um, Lionel Messi's or Cristiano Ronaldo's in our country that we don't know about. Um, our, our national team programs, male and female, do such a good job of scouring the globe for the best players that if you are talented enough to play at that level, they will find you. But Jason, and, I read on Twitter yesterday that that's not the case. <laughs> so it must be true if it's on Twitter that uh, um, I, I, I try and stay off social media as much as I can uh, because I, I find it can be a very, uh, very hostile place full of opinions and not a lot of facts. So, um, but I, I, I love this piece about, you know, the needs of the community being served and, and being there for the, for the kids. Cause when you ask people this question, you ask why you do what you do. They all say the same thing. Oh, I do it for the kids, but most people, uh, many people do. Some people don't. And, and they, 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 they just don't know what they don't know. And I feel like uh, someone like Sarah has got a really good grasp on what the role of a grassroots community club is and how to empower its people and to engage its people as to serve the needs of the children in that community. And, and hopefully one day they will go on to play at a higher level of the sport, whether it's at the university college level, whether it's professionally, whether it's for the national team. And then we celebrate that success. But mo- most importantly, you celebrate the great people that you develop out of your club for your community. And and that's a piece that I hear over and over again when I talk to people at the grassroots level across the country is just how important the the club is to the social fabric of the community. So plenty of, uh, plenty of good takeaways. Um, What's coming up next, Brad, in the the weeks ahead for Canada soccer and and on the, the the player front, what do we have to look forward to? Yeah, well, (laughs) Public health being what it is, uh, we've had to take a few steps backwards from some planned activity over the next couple of months. So um, it's looking more and more unlikely that we'll see our national teams uh, in action. Uh, obviously, we saw the announcement this week go out that our women's national team was scheduled to have a camp in England and play England, um, which would have been you know an important step on the road to Tokyo for them. But uh, unfortunately, um, you know our uh, our senior management staff, our, our medical committee, and, and the public health um, authorities effectively said that it wasn't the right thing for us at this time. So, so that camp was canceled, unfortunately. Um, you know, similarly, on the men's side, it's the same discussion. It's the same body. It's the same public health advice. So, uh, so not a lot of national team activity. I mean, obviously, we've got club competitions ongoing. Fonso Davies and four other Canadians, Scott Arfield, Jonathan David, Milan Borian, and Mandrakar James will uh, will start their UEFA Champions League campaigns. We've got a, um, a little closer to home. We've got Forge FC who will play in CONCACAF League um, this month. So they'll have their first CONCACAF League match. Uh, we still have the Canadian Championship uh, to be scheduled, but Forge will also play in the Canadian Championship final against Toronto FC. Toronto FC aren't doing too poorly for themselves. Uh, <laughs> so they, they've got um, December 8th, uh, you know, as their North Star, I believe. They're looking to that MLS final. Um, they're currently riding high in 
first place. Lucas Cavallini is riding high, so we'll be keeping an eye on the white caps on Montreal if they can pull themselves into a playoff spot. Um, NWSL will wrap up soon. Uh, lots of women's football in Europe, and nice to be able to watch some of the um, FA Women's Soccer League on uh, absolutely on Canadian television. So yeah, I've been just sort of keeping an eye on Janine Becky, who's looking stronger than I've ever seen her play. Uh, Adriana Lyon, uh, obviously in France. Jordan Kadisha is a dynamo. <laughs> Might be abusing that word today, but I, I, I'm here for it. Um, <laughs> Ashley Lawrence, obviously. <laughs> Um, not going to remember all the names here. I'm, I'm not getting through everybody, but yeah, lots, uh, lots of football happening. Uh, our national team players obviously are, are are playing in their club environments and will be in their club environments for the foreseeable future, and likely until likely until the, the early new year. Yeah, it's frustrating for sure. I know that a lot of work has gone into planning camps, planning games, and uh, unfortunately, that 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 had to be put to the back burner uh, as the the health of everyone, sta- all stakeholders, players, um, fans, staff, uh, everyone has to be uh, first and foremost at the, the front of our mind. So um, the good thing is that there are games to watch on TV and, and um, you know, hopefully everyone is, is staying safe uh, at home. Spend time with your family. That's what I would say. Use this as an opportunity. Look for the opportunity in uh, in all of this. Oh, that's when the, the one thing I forgot you had to correct me on. Uh, I think I said uh, in, in the chat with uh, Sarah that the uh, the word for crisis is the same as as uh, as opportunity in Chinese. The, you, you have a fact correction for me, Brad, on that one? So the internet tells me that this is not accurate in any way but that if <laughs> but but that the two characters for crisis in in uh, mandarin are, are are a combination of danger and opportunity i see um so you know apologies to all chinese canadians who know that that's not 100 percent true but i would we'll ask some it. someone someone can can clarify for us email us at podcast at canadasoccer.com <laughs> And, uh, and let us know because I, I want to make sure that I'm using the right information. Um, but as always, as we say this every week, stay safe, look after each other, be good to each other, and uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Take care.